Hi, welcome to HubBytes. I'm Sunil Regge, consultant psychiatrist from PsychScene. Today I'll be taking you through the mechanism of action and some clinical pearls with regards to the new antipsychotic lorazodone that's on the market in Australia. Now, lorazodone comes under the umbrella of atypical antipsychotics, second generation antipsychotic, and it also is a metabolically friendly antipsychotic. Now, before I go into the details, I'd like to state that this is not to be construed as medical advice. This is general information only. It is very, very important if you're a non-medical individual, please discuss all of this with your doctor. So with that in mind, let's go to the details. So lorazodone, like other atypical antipsychotics, besides of course the partial agonist, lorazodone has a D2-5-HD2A antagonistic property. The D2 antagonism in the mesolimbic pathway treats psychotic symptoms. The 5-HD2A antagonism increases dopamine in the prefrontal cortex and the subcortical areas, thereby mitigating any side effects that would occur from D2 blockade in those areas. But lorazodone also tends to have some unique receptor activity, 5-HD7 antagonism. Now this receptor antagonism gives it a procognitive and antidepressant property. Further antidepressant properties come from alpha-2A and alpha-2C antagonism and 5-HD1A partial agonism gives it a further antidepressant property. Therefore, lorazodone is indicated in schizophrenia. It's on the PBS for schizophrenia in Australia, but lorazodone is also indicated and has good evidence in bipolar depression, major depressive disorder with mixed features. And it is prescribed as an antipsychotic in combination with the antidepressant in major depressive disorder with psychosis. So for these three indications, of course, it's not on the PBS. However, it is used off-label by clinicians. Now, why is this metabolically friendly? What we do know is that there are two receptors, the M1 and the histamine receptor, the H1. Now, these two receptors, when blocked, are associated with metabolic dysfunction, increased weight gain, disturbance of lipids and increased blood glucose. Lorazodone does not have antihistaminergic or antimuscarinic properties and therefore is metabolically friendly. So those are some of the advantages. It is metabolically friendly. So it's metabolically friendly and it also does not have a significant sedative action because it does not have antihistaminergic property. Now what are the side effects? Now because it does not have this sedating effect, one of the main side effects when you prescribe lorazodone is to look out for akathisia. And akathisia as we know is at milder levels of subjective compulsion to move, but in severe cases it can be a subjective and objective compulsion to move and it's very very distressing for patients. So akathisia is something that one has to be mindful of and this can be mitigated by prescribing lorazodone in the evening with about 30 minutes after food. Why after food? Because absorption of lorazodone is enhanced by food, so it's crucial that it's given at in the evening after food to minimize, well, to maximize absorption in a way, but to minimize akathisia incidence as well. Now, what are the doses of lorazodone? It can be started at 20 milligrams. However, generally 40 milligrams, it can be started off and it goes to 160 milligrams. Now, in some cases, in my personal experience, again, this is not to be construed as medical advice, but in very, very severe patients with psychosis, I have had to go up to 240 milligrams. And the reason might be is either because they are CYP3A4 inducers, they're therefore reducing the levels of lorazodone. But the other possibility is that they, they require higher levels of dopamine D2 blockade and thereby requiring a higher dose. Of course, when the dose goes higher, akathisia and elevated prolactin need to be monitored closely. So the main side effect to keep an out, eye out for is akathisia. And of course, because it's a dopamine blocker, prolactin also may be um, elevated with lorazodone use. Now what are the other clinical aspects? I mentioned the enzyme CYP3A4. Lorazodone is metabolized by CYP3A4. 
What that means is smoking does not reduce levels of lorazepam because smoking induces CYP1A2 that can reduce the levels of certain antipsychotics, most notably clozapine. CYP3A4 enzyme, however, one has to be careful for with lorazepam is if antifungals such as ketoconazole that are inhibitors of CYP3A4 are prescribed, though that, those medications can increase the levels of lorazepam. So one's got to be cautious with regards to that. On the other hand, rifampicin, for example, induces CYP3A4 and therefore can reduce levels. So these are some of the pharmacokinetic interactions one's got to be mindful of. Now, one of the other important aspects to take into account is a switch. Now, what might happen is the patient might be on a metabolically unfriendly agent such as olanzapine or quetiapine, and you want to switch them over from olanzapine or quetiapine to lorazepam. The key principle here is that we know that olanzapine, and I might just rub this off so that we can see this clearly. So what we have is that we know that olanzapine tends to have the muscarinic and the histaminergic blocking properties. But we want to change to an agent that does not have that. So the key principle here is if we suddenly stop olanzapine, we would end up with an antihistaminergic and an anti-muscarinic rebound. And that can result in severe agitation, uh, pr presence of psychotic symptoms, in some cases delirium. But of course, if it stops suddenly, rebound psychosis is the other issue as well. Therefore, the key principle to minimize anticholinergic and antihistaminergic rebound is go slow when reducing the agent. And if we look at four weeks here and two weeks, you may want to consider the reduction somewhere like this off the olanzapine or the quetiapine. And this is very, very individual. The clinician may reduce the dose 10 to 25% just gradually, whilst introducing the other agent gradually. And you might start maybe at two weeks here, and then you might reach the particular optimized dose. So this is very, very individual. Different patients, my experience, require different regimes. But the key principle is, I always make sure that the olanzapine is reduced gradually and the last 2.5 milligrams of the olanzapine may need to be in place for a bit longer sometimes two weeks sometimes four weeks in some patients because they find if they stop it too early they get rebound insomnia rebound agitation and some rebound racing thoughts for example which can be very very unpleasant and if this is stopped and lorazepam is introduced akathisia agitation these can be compounding factors that can cause a lot of distress to patients. So the last 2.5 milligrams of olanzapine can be kept a bit longer, allowing the histamine receptor to sensitize to that lower dose before stopping it. In some cases, from a clinical perspective, I have used medication like clonazepam, 0.5 milligrams, which has GABA A and GABA B potentiating properties. So clonazepam, longer acting as well, lower risk of dependence. And what clonazepam can do is allow for the transition from olanzapine to lorazepam, successfully mitigating any rebound anticholinergic, antihistaminergic effects, but also mitigating the possibility of akathisia. Now, one other important pearl when administering lorazepam is it is very, very important, as mentioned earlier, to give it 30 minutes after food in the evening. Two reasons. One, 30 minutes after food to maximize absorption, because if you say with food, sometimes patients might just have it and then go and have dinner half an hour later or an hour later, and that might cause issues in the absorption, or might not result in maximal absorption. And the other thing is the reason why we give it in the evening is to minimize the effects of akathisia. So that's lorazepam in a nutshell. In the next video, I will take you through the other antipsychotic, which is a partial agonist, which is brexpropazole. You've probably heard of aripiprazole. We do have brexpropazole in the market now, which is also metabolically friendly, and I'll take you through that. So I hope you've enjoyed this particular video. Take care, stay safe. I'll see you soon in another Hub Bite.